The topic for tonight is going to be the endocrine system. And that's what we're going to look at now. All right. So as an introduction, the as we know, the endocrine system is the system that produces hormones within the body. Okay? This is the generalized topic of endocrinology. And there are seven uh, different... Uh, endocrine organs, and they all produce different hormones that help the body to function and to have a successful life. Now, the only part that is touched on in EMT syllabus curriculum is really the pancreas and the whole diabetes situation. So this is the one part of endocrinology that is really focused on in the EMT school. And then that's probably what we're going to mainly uh, delve into and talk about tonight. So as I just said, um, the glands, they secrete hormones, and they all do different jobs. We don't need to really get into all the different ones. So glucose metabolism, all right? Um, as we know, the brain constantly needs glucose and oxygen, right? These are um, what the body uses to produce um, fuel. And you can't really survive without both glucose and oxygen. On the other hand, if glucose levels get too high, that is also going to be considered a problem. The main problem that we will see in EMS is going to always be hypoglycemia. Okay, and that's the one that we're going to talk about. That's what we need to understand. The pancreas produces, it says here, two, two chemicals, glucagon and insulin. And it does that in response to the amount of glucose that is found in the body. So the word the word diabetes mellitus uh, actually is defined or translated into sweet urine. Um, this is the way that people were able to determine a uh, hundred years ago a physician would taste somebody's urine. Uh, that was a normal way to measure uh, how much glucose the body was retaining and whether they, you know, had the diabetes mellitus or not. So that is the, that is the, um, Um, so glucose being too high um, can affect the eyesight, cardiovascular disease, kidney failure. These are quite common with um, when the glucose gets too high and it's not managed. All right, so we deal with two emergencies in the field. We deal with hyperglycemia, which we know means too much, hyper, too high, excessive amount, and hypoglycemia, that would be too low or too little. Um, remember that your patient 
may tell you that they have type one or type two. Um, remember that it doesn't matter to you if they have type one or type two other than to document it. So what is the difference? Now, those of you that have been doing this for a long time, let's say, uh, will be familiar with the different names that we used to give to type one and type two. These are somewhat new names, right? We used to call them IDDM, which is insulin dependent DN, diabetes mellitus, or NIDDM, non insulin dependent. So when you come in and the family says, yeah, look, we've got Susan over here, she's a diabetic, right? What should your first question be? When they tell you, they introduce you, and they tell you she is a diabetic. What should be your first question? So the easiest question to ask is, does she take shots regularly? Does she take insulin? This will answer the type one and type two situation. If they take insulin, they are type one. And if they do not, they are type two. It's that simple. So do they take insulin shots? Yes or no? And this is really all you need to establish when you get to one of these patients. Don't make the family crazy. Are they a type one or type two? These are complex medical terms. This is not something that every regular person or caregiver or family member is going to know. So a simple question is, do they take insulin shots? Now, for you and me, we need to know, maybe they don't know, maybe they're not sure, maybe the regular caregiver is not around. Where can we look to find out if they take insulin or not? Well, it's the refrigerator. Insulin must be kept in the refrigerator. They have not yet developed an insulin shot that can be kept, you know, with all the pill bottles. Uh, so it's, it's that simple. Here we go. So DM, diabetes mellitus, type 1. I told you type 1 means what? That they do not have, they are not producing um, the hormone called insulin. And here it says onset usually from early childhood um, through the fourth decade of life. Um, it used to be called, even before IDDM, it was called juvenile diabetes. And that was a real name for this. Um, but they got rid of all that. Now it's very simple, type 1, type 2. Uh, type 1 diabetes may have an insulin pump. Now, I'm noticing, maybe you are too, that insulin pumps are getting more and more common. Uh, more and more people have them. And they're great. They're really great because the insulin pump reads the glucose in the sugar, uh, the glucose in the blood, and will adjust how much insulin they actually need. So the old way was, yes, they had to take their sugar and then draw up a certain number of units. The pumps, you know, are really good. Uh, however, the pumps can malfunction. And always ask, you know, do they take insulin? Is it in the refrigerator or do they have an insulin pump? Um most common metabolic disease of childhood. Um, so yeah, these are things that can be seen. Let's just run through them. Polyuria means frequent urination. Polydipsia is increased drinking, thirst, um, and needing to quench that. Uh, polyphagia, which I honestly don't see much, but that is increased 
hunger, um, weight loss, and fatigue. So, yeah, I see, oh, I see all these. So, patient's blood glucose levels above normal. Then the kidney filtration system gets overwhelmed, and that's when it spills into the urine. Hence, the old days, the whole check was the urine. Uh, if there is not enough glucose, then we may go into this DKA situation. Um, DKA would be a hyperglycemia problem, okay? And I will tell you, I will please mute yourselves, thank you. I will tell you that they're very rare. It's very rare to actually get a DKA in the field. Very, very rare. Now, you can get where the machine takes a BGL and gives you a result high, HI. Uh, that doesn't automatically mean that they have DKA. Okay, so we would have to test for ketones, We'd have to look at the breathing and the blood and one thing and another. The, the thing that we always teach EMTs is about Kuzmo respirations. Um, that is a result of DKA. Um, and this, what is it? Why are they doing it? It's very simple. Kuzmo respirations is an attempt to blow off the acid. Obviously, when it comes to breathing, CO2 is the acid, and the more they try to blow it off, will try to change the metabolic state, or what we call the pH, right? The acid-base balance. Um, and that, that's really all what Cosmo Respirations is. So how do we get... So the, how does a patient develop this DKA? So there is hyperglycemia, which means there, are, there is tons and tons of glucose in the blood, okay? Tons, loads. However, it cannot get into the cells. The cells are being deprived. The cells are being starved. And the glucose cannot get into the cell. So at one point or another, and it does take time, this is not a quick problem, the cells will start to break down their own fat that is attached to them. And this is where the, so they will take fat and they will make sugar, glucose out of it. And there is a resulting product, a byproduct of this um, reaction, and those are called ketones. And if any of you have ever smelled the nail polish remover, which is called acetone, it smells similar to what a DKA patient's breath will smell like. So there will literally be the acetone smell when they are in DKA. Um, DKA can present with uh, generalized illness, abdominal pains, body aches, nausea, vomiting, AMS, okay, or even unresponsiveness. So yes, as it says, DKA can result in death. Um, I'm just going to keep saying that I think maybe I've seen one legit DKA in over 20 years. Um, so they're not that common in our community. Type two. So we dealt with type one. All right. Now, type two is in a way more complex. They are producing insulin, 
Okay, so they are not completely out of the picture. They're producing insulin, but there's a resistance to the insulin, okay? And it's not doing enough. So um, pancreas produces more insulin, right? To because uh, of the increased blood glucose and the dysfunction of the insulin receptors. Um, diet and exercise can help. That is a true story. Diet and exercise can definitely help with type two. So oral medications. Now there are so many um, oral medications that are available. Uh, I would just go out on a limb and say that um, glucophage is probably one of the most common that you see, but there are literally tens and tens of different medications that I'm seeing out there. Um, they work in different ways. We don't have time to go into all the different methods and different types. Some stimulate the receptors, others decrease the glucagon and glucose store in the liver. So these all these types of medications are typically used with type 2 diabetes. Um, Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, if someone has a Dexcom, that would be type 1? Um, so symptomatic hyperglycemia will be when blood glucose levels are high. Um, if they have altered mental status, right? Um, type one patients, you can lead to ketoacidosis. We spoke about that, even dehydration. Type two lead to a non-ketoic hypermosal state of dehydration. This is common. This is more common, and I see this way more often than the actual ketoacidosis. So this is this is maybe new to some of you, hyper hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic non-ketoic syndrome. So we give this a nice abbreviation, HHNS because that's a very lot um, of words um, and uh, tongue twister to say all that. So HHNS is the way that it's referred to. Um, and usually these are type two diabetics that are uncontrolled and um, um, signs and symptoms uh, would be hyperglycemia, right? You're going to have high readings, AMS, drowsiness, lethargy, dehydration, um, thirst, uh, could even be dark colored urine, um, visual or sensory deficits, um, maybe some muscle weakness, and possibly seizures. So those are just some of the things that would fall under that. Um, high glucose levels, right? We spoke about this, will be cause glucose in the urine. Um, they can't seem to drink enough. Urine becomes dark and concentrated. Uh, they can become, again, as we said, unconscious and um, have seizures due to the dehydration. Now, symptomatic hypoglycemia, this is something that you're going to see uh, way more often, uh, is an acute emergency where the patient's blood glucose drops must be corrected swiftly. So right now in New York City, we are saying that 60 and below is considered hypoglycemia. If they are symptomatic and they're at 80, uh, you can still treat that, okay? So that's a New York City thing. If they are 
symptomatic. Um, so this can be either type one or type two, doesn't matter. Um, glucose is rapidly taken out of the body and out of the blood and the uh, glucose levels fall and they just don't have enough to supply the brain. Uh, symptom again, uh, mental status. That's the first thing that goes. Patients become aggressive or display unusual behavior, right? They call EMS and they say, Bob ain't acting right. Someone's up, right? Unconscious, uh, can quickly fall in consciousness. Uh, hypoglycemia develops much more quickly than hyper and signs and symptoms of hyper. Like hypoglycemia, I think we've we've spoken about um, what you would expect. So here's a sort of a chart showing that here below 80 is hypoglycemia. Below 40, they're calling it a hypoglycemic crisis. Uh, 80 to 120 would be normal, and then higher and higher and higher until. HHNS or DKA, or it becomes a difficult uh, crisis or emergency. <laughs> These emergencies happen really quickly in the hypo, and you can understand why, right? If here's normal and here's already a crisis, it's not got far to drop. All right. Um, hypoglycemia is quickly reversed by giving the patient glucose. And remember, this has to only be a conscious patient, conscious patient. Please do not give anybody who is semi-responsive or unresponsive, do not put anything in their mouth. Scene, scene safety, there may be syringes around, standard precautions. Uh, what is the NOI? What is the nature of illness? I don't think this we have to go into. Um, general impression, right? Airway, breathing. Okay, you don't know for sure that there's a problem with insulin or diabetes. So remember always airway, breathing. Uh, there may be cosmo respirations. There may be that, that acetone breath, um, which I'm saying is very rare. Hypoglycemics will have normal shallow respirations and deal with the respiratory distress obviously quickly. Circulatory, um, okay, so this is something that they always used to test on in, uh, in state exams. Um, warm, dry skin, hyperglycemia. Moist, pale, hypoglycemia. So that's good to remember, okay? Um, and it's right there. Weak rapid pulse hypoglycemia. The way I teach people new EMTs is rapid onset, rapid pulse. Okay, and that's all hypoglycemia. Transport with ultimate status, they can't swallow. Um, obviously, you've got to get medics or you've got to move quickly. History, chief complaint, get a good history, what's going on with your patient. Um, figure out, is it hypo, is it hyper? Have they taken insulin? They didn't need, right? You can, you can make these calculations. Sample history, right? Do you take pills? Um, do you wear an insulin pump? Right? Usual insulin dose. Maybe they took more than they usually do. What was their eating? And illness, any sort of illness can throw everything off and all bets are off when the patient is ill or sick. Physical exam, do a regular physical exam, GCS, okay? And, okay, obviously, glucometer, if it's available, your protocols do allow it. Hypoglycemia. Um, respirations, normal to rapid, pulse is rapid, right? We spoke about this. Skin is typically pale and clammy, all right? Hyperglycemia, respirations may be deep, rapid, 
pulse may be rapid, weak and thready, skin warm and dry. So there is definitely quite discernible differences. Glucometer, make sure you know how to use it. Um, 80 to 120 would be normal uh, interventions. What can you do? Um, well, you can do quite a lot. If the hypoglycemic conscious, see, who can swallow, then drink juice, put the, put the, um, the, um, the glucose that you carry or you should carry into juice and let them drink it. Do not give Diet Coke, please. Um, hypoglycemic unconscious patients, um, risk of aspiration. So do not give them anything in their mouth. Obviously, that needs to be IV usually or IM. Uh, glucagon is not allowed in New York State or New York City. So you may need a medical director or a medic. Um, if you cannot test for whatever reason, you should be able to work it out through a thorough assessment of the patient. And this is very common. Patients who refuse transport to oral glucose. Um, so you gotta call you gotta call medical control. It happens a lot after IV treatment, they they often don't want to go. Um, this is what most agencies carry. Um, so the best way to deal with this is to see if they've got apple juice or orange juice, grape juice in the refrigerator or in the house. Squeeze this in, mix it up, and give it to them. Let them drink it. Do not feed it to them. If you're feeding it to them, they should not be getting anything oral. Um, hey, Davis, what, is there anything we can do for the unconscious victim? Yeah, we as we well, not we, we we can't give any intervention. Um, follow the protocol. So in New York, you're allowed to give juice, drink, and you can give the tube of glucose and uh, provide transport. Presentation. <laughs> Seizures uh, should be considered very serious. Uh, hypoglycemia is a cause of seizures, uh, and it may be a life-threatening problem. Again, you're going to need medics to manage it. AMS. Uh, but, um, also, I have, um, I don't know if it's a question, but to determine the source, because Seizures could cause hypoglycemia, but hypoglycemia could also cause seizures. So how would you know which one to recognize that? Second. You hear me? Yeah. Not sure what happened here. 